the second main task tonight. Tonight we are honored to welcome my close personal friend, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. It was just seven, seven months ago that Rahm was sworn in as mayor, so let me briefly review some history. Rahm was born in Chicago and raised in Wilmette. His mother was a civil rights activist who marched with Martin Luther King Jr. in the 60s. His father was a pediatrician who was a medic in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. The second of three sons, Rahm was offered a scholarship to study with Chicago's Joffrey Ballet, but instead chose to attend Sarah Lawrence College. After graduating, he went on to earn a master's degree in speech and communications at Northwestern University. And while there, he actually pioneered the concept that every speech could be improved with four-letter words. <laughs> in 1989, he was the chief fundraiser for Richard Daley's successful mayoral campaign where he had garnered the attention of Bill Clinton's campaign, which promptly hired him. Rahm then raised a record amount of money for Clinton, keeping his presidential campaign afloat during rocky days during the primaries. After Clinton took office, Rahm rose to become the president's chief political advisor, and he scored many victories during his first White House tour, including securing the North American Treaty Free, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement passage. Rahm left the Clinton administration in 1998 to return to Chicago, embarking on a successful three-year stint as an investment banker. As a result, Rahm, you left the 99% and joined the 1%. <laughs> Welcome aboard. It's good to have you. In 2002, he was elected to Congress on his first attempt repre representing Chicago's North Side. Three years later, he took over the, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, engineering the party's uh, takeover of the House of Representatives in 2006. A lot happier day for Rahm than for me. By the time President Obama asked him to become Chief of Staff in 2009, Rahm was Democratic Caucus Chair, making him fourth in, in, in the House leadership. President Obama took over during a very tumultuous time for our country. In the midst of, a, of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, with two costly and unpopular wars, despite these imposing challenges, Rahm accepted the President's call to be White House Chief of Staff, and he proved to be an adept presidential, presidential gatekeeper, as well as an efficient policymaker. He led the charge on Capitol Hill to win approval for funding for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the Recovery Act, and health care law, uh, health care reform, the health care reform law. In 2010, he left the cabinet to announce his run for mayor of Chicago. And on February 22nd, he won 55% of the vote in a six-candidate race. He took the reins during a, a historically difficult time for all cities, and Chicago was no exception. The city had a budget shortfall topping $650 million, not including the hundreds of millions of dollars in underfunded pensions, or the $700 million deficit in the CPS budget. Additionally, he put more than uh, 1,000, uh, he put more police officers on the streets in high crime neighborhoods, fulfilling his campaign to add 1,000 officers to the streets. On his first day, he lopped off $70 million, $75 million from the city budget, and he has, been act, he has been equally active in Springfield. Before even taking office, he successfully lobbied the state legislature to pass a landmark education package that allows school districts more freedom to fire bad teachers, makes it harder for teachers to strike, and finally gives... <laughs> and, fi and even as important, finally gives students a full, day, a full school day. <laughs> Job creation has also, also been at the top of his list. During his seven months in office, the mayor has brought 10,000 new jobs to the city from some of the best companies in America, including Motorola, J.P. Morgan, Walgreens, GE Capital, United Airlines, and most recently, Sara Lee. 
He has articulated a simple formula to ensure that Chicago remains a world-class city. Safe streets, strong schools, stable finances. His first budget as mayor passed the city council unanimously. However, the budget process was not a one-man operation. Citizens were invited to join the conversation. Mayor Emanuel held two budget town halls over the summer. And for the first time in Chicago's history, the mayor created a website to serve as an online forum for discussion between lawmakers and taxpayers. He also brought ethics reform and transparency to City Hall. Right after he finished his inaugural speech in Millennium Park, he went straight to his office on the fifth floor of City Hall, sat down at his desk, and signed six executive orders. He shut the revolving door between lobbyists and city government and banned lobbyists from contributing to political campaigns. And he persuaded the city council to pass his own ethics, its own ethics ordinance, barring former members who have been convicted of a felony from stepping on the council floor or in its back room. It also needs to be said that for as much as he is known for his hard-charging, take-no-prisoner style, Mayor Emanuel is equally gracious and, and sensitive. Rahm eats, sleeps, and breathes Chicago. It's in his bones and in his blood, which I imagine pumps at a fairly rapid rate. <laughs> After his wife, Amy, and their three children, Chicago tops a short but distinguished list of things Rahm loves. Please help me welcome the new mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it's been noted, uh, your election, which was unanimous. Uh, I haven't seen that since my budget passed, so congratulations on that. I was listening to that introduction. I want you to know that I started this job 6'3 and 250 pounds, and this is what I got left. <laughs> and that's dripping wet. I want to congratulate you. Now you have two organizations to run, John the Chicago Economic Club, and Republicans for Rom. So, um, <laughs> and in all honesty, John, I want, you to, I want you to make sure you get your priorities right, okay? I'm counting on you. John has become a leader of an organization that has helped Chicago make the most of the challenges over the last 80 years. But tonight is unique in the Economic Club's history. Yes, we have executives from all types of industry. Many of you helped turn Chicago into the world-class city it is today. But I also want to single out the young leaders that are with you today, the future that are sitting beside you. In this room are the teachers, the doctors, the lawyers, the ministers, the executives, who will shape Chicago in the years to come. And believe me, that future is not too far away. It seems like just five minutes ago, I was Senator Simon's finance director when he was running for Senate, and later the honor of working for Mayor Daley. Back then, I was brash, profane, competitive, very young. Now I'm brash, profane, and competitive, and not very young. But I don't want the young people here to get the wrong idea. Those aren't the qualities you need to be mayor. Those are just the qualities you need to survive as Brother Emmanuel, <laughs> with an older and younger brother. When I was growing up, I gotta be honest, my brothers never thought I would be here tonight addressing the Economic Club of Chicago. And when you were listening to John, and I was starting out in politics, I don't think the members of the Economic Club thought I would be addressing you as mayor. So, <laughs> the Economic Club has had Prime Minister Tony Blair, President Jimmy Carter, CEO Jack Welch. After World War II, you had Omar Bradley here. And what made that speech remarkable is Omar Bradley did not talk about the victory of World War II, but he talked about the challenges ahead for the battlefield and that what worked for us in World War II would not work for us in the future. And he saw the future when he spoke from this podium. In 1950s, the Economic Club of Chicago hosted a young senator from Massachusetts, John Kennedy, later to become president. And in that speech, 
John Kennedy talked about the importance of aligning America with emerging nations and their markets. In the 1950s, he could see over the horizon into the 21st century and see the country that we were to become and the economy that we were to become by merging with emerging nations and their economies. General Bradley, President Kennedy, made the most of their time by discussing the dangers and the opportunities ahead. And we, too, have an opportunity tonight not to dwell on our city's past, but to look to the future and to build a strong Chicago of tomorrow. Nobody respects the leaders in this room more than I do. So I'm going to pay you the ultimate compliment of candor and honesty. I'm here to talk about what we must do to rebuild and reimagine our education system. We have the best kids in the world. But when they emerge from our system, whether from our high schools or our community colleges, they lag far behind their peers, both in this country and around the world. We are not providing them an education that allows them to reach their full potential. That, I know, is a concern to all of us who care about Chicago's children and Chicago's future. And whether we are from the north side, south side, the west side, or downtown, we are one Chicago with one future. The task is enormous, but the equation is simple. The future of Chicago hinges on the future of its school system. That is the equation that drives me every day. We all know this. Education is a great equalizer. If you provide people an education, a city and a country can succeed. I know I'm not the first politician or public servant to point that out or to say that changes in education are essential and, and, need, and, much, and urgently needed. Some elected officials have said that early childhood is the key, and they are right. Others have stressed strong high schools, math and science education, and they are right. But when it comes to investing in education, it can't be multiple choice. It must be all the above. From the cradle to the career, from kindergarten to college, that is where we must invest our resources and our time. When you look at the edu education debate of the last 30 years, there has been a great deal of focus on the early years, the high school years, our four-year institutions. What has not been a focus is on, the G on what has been the creation of the GI Bills, and that is our community colleges, despite the fact that our community colleges are where a majority of the students go for their post-secondary education and training. By overlooking these critical training centers, we are missing an important opportunity. And our economy today is now showing the strains of this years of neglect. When employers cannot find skilled workers during one of the deepest recessions in American history, that should tell us something. We have a tool in our arsenal, and it is not, we are not doing all that it can do, and it is sitting on the sidelines. It must be modernized for the new economy. Our community colleges were a linchpin for America's post-war boom, and they are just as critical today. They are as important to our economic growth and potential as a city as any other part of our educational system. Modernizing them is how we will continue to attract the industries and make the most of our strengths. I want you to think about this for just one minute. There are more students in our city colleges, 127,000, than in all of Chicago's four-year institutions combined, 127,000. Don't get me wrong. Chicago and the state of Illinois have great higher ed institutions. We know them, Northwestern, University of Chicago, University of Illinois, DePaul, Columbia, Loyola, Roosevelt, UIC. We have two of the top five business schools in the country, Booth and Kellogg. We have great law schools. In technology, we have IIT, Fermi, Argonne, U of I. Chicago is also the destination of choice for the Big Ten states and Big Ten institutions, be they at Madison, Ann Arbor, Columbus, Iowa City, South Bend, South Bend Minneapolis, and St. Paul. We have overlooked in, in the develop we have overlooked in the development of our workforce is the preparation of our own children. We have not developed the educational system 
that helps our economy grow. We can no longer allow the practices of the past to sabotage our hopes, our hopes for the future. When I talk to CEOs, I hear a regular message from them about their workforce and the skills they need. Whether it's Pat Wirtz at ADM, Glenn Tilton at United, Glenn Tolman at Allscripts, Randall Stevenson at AT&T, Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, or Vikram Pandit at Citibank, or some of you actually in this room as well. You all tell me the same thing. From welders to code writers to workers in healthcare, IT services, you need more skilled employees. We need skilled workers to rebuild our infrastructure. We need them to care for the sick. We need them to welcome the millions who visit Chicago each year in our hospitality industry. We need them to make the products people want to buy and to write the code that powers the knowledge economy. But employers can't find skilled workers, and workers can't find jobs. Like the rest of the country, Chicago has a skills gap. And we can't say we haven't been warned. I want to give you a set of headlines literally just from the last four weeks. From the Wall Street Journal, November 16th, and I quote, study finds U.S. workers under pressure to improve skills but need so more support. In the Wall Street Journal on November 25th, in an unexpected twist, some skilled jobs go begging. I just did that to prove to you I read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the 1% applause there. Uh, <laughs> from Cranes on December 2nd, in an, article, in an article titled Closing the Tech Gap, quote, more than 60% of the small businesses are struggling to find skilled applicants. From the Chicago Tribune, one week ago today on the cover of its business page, quote, jobs go unfilled as skills fall flat. But I don't need to read about the skills gap from the Wall Street Journal, the Tribune, or Cranes. I see it and hear it every day from the people of the city of Chicago. Now, I was on the L six weeks ago, right across from the cell at 35th and Dan Ryan. I met a young man. He had just left Wright Community College, taken the L on his way to his job on the south side at Target Warehouse. That young man is doing everything right, everything we can ever ask him to do. He's holding a full-time job, and he's going to school, and he's trying to get his skills right. And when he graduates, that diploma should have economic value for him. And we cannot honestly look at ourselves and say, given he has taken responsibility, we're giving him everything he needs to do for his opportunity. So when he graduates, like the rest of us ourselves, when he puts whatever school it is, Wright, Truman, Kennedy King, Olive Harvey, it should have value to him and meaning to us as future employers. And that just doesn't work today. And that is the responsibility of everybody in this room to change. And I cannot, in good conscience, when he walks in an interview, says that Harold Washington, Malcolm X, or any of the schools on his resume, that his work should pay off. It should pay off for him. And if we work together, starting tonight, it will. Because that young man looking for opportunity and the CEO in the corporate suite looking for skilled workers are looking for the same thing. They're looking for each other. The community college is the link in our, for our employees and our, employees need, and our employers need, but it's been missing in action. Companies need workers to make products, to design products to wire the products, to move the products, to sell the products, and community colleges can pro provide them those workers. As mayor, I can't read the headlines about the skill gap, and I can't see it every day and say that's not my problem. It is my problem, because I think it's unconscionable that you can have 10% unemployment and about 100,000 job opening in the Chicagoland area, and we can't do anything about it. Those two facts do not go together in one of the worst recessions in our country's history. 100,000 opening and 10% unemployment. And the answer is right under our nose, and it's the community college system. And let's be candid. 
Most community colleges offer students what they should have learned in high school. Too often, they provide remedial learning to compensate for gaps in their education system of past. That is not why our community college system was established. The community colleges, historically, were the catapult for the World War II generation coming home from the battlefield. The generation of Americans who became the most productive and economically expansive in American history. And the community colleges can serve the same function in the 21st century. At the beginning of the 20th century, a high school education was essential for the industrial economy. At the beginning of the 21st century, two years of quality post-secondary education are equally essential. That's especially true here in Chicago when you look at the, our engines of economic growth, transportation and logistics, healthcare sciences, IT and computer sciences, convention and tourism, professional services, and high-end manufacturing. We need our community colleges linked up to those growth sectors. And, do that, and if we do that, we need our industry leaders linked up to the schools. Because of our central location, we are a transportation and logistics juggernaut. But we cannot rest on our location alone. And the question is, will we train the workers we need to capitalize on that advantage? Because of our private sector industries that are the leaders in healthcare sciences, like Abbott Labs, Walgreens, Baxter's, Allscripts, and our hospitals like Rush, Strozier, Northwestern, University of Chicago, Merge, we are becoming a global healthcare hub. The question is, will we train for it? Because of McCormick Place and O'Hare, we continue to be a world leader in tourism and the convention industry. The question is, will we train for it? Because of Navistar, Ford, Mattel Steel, we serve as a national center for high-end manufacturing. The question is, will we train for it? Because of Motorola Solutions, Molex, and Groupon, we can be the nation's next hotspot for technology and innovation. The question is, will we train for it? Because we are home to great global businesses like Aon, Boeing, and United. And we are home to some of the great law firms, great consulting firms like Accenture, great accounting firms like Ernst & Young. We are a professional service hub for the larger Midwest. The question is, will we train for it? Because we're about to launch the largest infrastructure project and any investment for any city in the country, not just for our water, but for our roads, and soon for our mass transit, we will need strong partnership with labor. We will need workers in skilled trades. The question is, will we train for it? And tonight, here in this room, we answer that fundamental question. Don't worry, it's not a take-home exam. Tonight, we charge our community colleges with a new mission to train the workforce of today for the jobs of tomorrow, to give our students the ability to achieve a middle-class standard of living, to provide our companies with the skilled workers they need. Cities like Miami and Louisville have tried something similar, but in a single industry. Miami matched a community college with healthcare sciences. Louisville has linked a community college with UPS to be a leader in logistics. But this is Chicago. We do things bigger, bolder, more ambitious, and more comprehensive, something to match the diversity and the depth of our economy, which is one of our strengths. So tonight, I'm announcing that we'll tailor six of our community colleges to train students in specific growth sectors where we know we can dominate the future. We are announcing the first two schools and their partners tonight. Malcolm X College will be the school that drives Chicago's leadership in healthcare sciences. Rush Medical Center, Stroger, and Northwestern Hospitals, Advocate Healthcare, Baxter, Walgreens, and Allscripts have agreed to partner with Malcolm X College to develop their curriculum and train their faculty so the workers that will drive our healthcare sciences will be trained for the future jobs. Olive Harvey. Olive Harvey will be the Center for Excellence in Transportation, Distribution, and Logistics. They will work with UPS, Canadian National Railway, AAR, BNSF, among others. They will be Arl of Harvey's partner in modernizing their programs and providing the training students need to compete in the transportation, distribution, and logistics field. As mayor of Chicago, I cannot protect our city from a, either a global or a national recession. 
but I can address the skills gap so that no employer in the middle of a deep recession is without employees they need and so that no worker is out with the skills they need to find a job. We have a dynamic new chancellor of our community college, Cheryl Hyman, and I've appointed each of the six new city college presidents to oversee this modernization. But this reinvention and the investments required to make our school system world class is something that all of us must be a part of. Reinvention is nothing new for the city of Chicago. Chicago went from a remote trading post to a center of global industry. From the cinders of the Great Fire, our city has become a showcase of worldwide architectural fame. Chicago did not reinvent itself by itself. Our growth was forged by those who were willing to make tough choices and the right investments by people who were not afraid to see the future with all its challenges and to see the opportunities in those challenges. Today, all of us in this room must be those people as well. And tonight, I ask you to be a partner in the transformation of our community colleges. Every year, for the next three years, we will modernize two schools and match them with partners in the private sector to train the workers for our factories, for our offices, for our hospitals, for our hotel industry, and for our infrastructure, and for the computer science field. In the same way that you help Booth and Kellogg prepare their graduates for careers in management and finances, which is appropriate, we need you to partner with the community colleges so that their curriculums meet the ne sector's needs that power the Chicago economy. I'm not talking about hiring a person or even a partnership or an internship. It's deeper and more fundamental than that. This is about ensuring that the curriculum taught at the community colleges provides the skills you need at your workplace or your place of employment. By making a diploma from our community colleges into a ticket for the workforce of tomorrow, we will make them the first option of job training, not the last. I do not expect you to do this alone. Our community colleges and the leaders will be right there with you. And whatever you invest in our schools, you will get back many times over because of the skilled employees who have the training to work in your operations. There's no greater investment we can make in the life of our city than the one we make in the lives of our students. And I can tell you that personally, there's no greater reward. Meeting young people on the campaign trail or in my visits to schools as mayor, that's something I see every day. Every day our students wake up optimistic about their future. They believe they can achieve great things, and many of them do, even a great, against great odds. If our students have the strength to turn obstacles into opportunities, surely, as adults, we do too. Some say that comprehensive investments in all levels of education in our communities is impossible. Today's fiscal challenges make it more difficult. Yes, we have to set priorities. And yes, we have to make tough choices. And that's what we're doing tonight. But to those who say that we can't afford to confront these challenges, I say we can't afford not to. And let me tell you something. We're already doing the changes at our K through 12. This year alone, four new charter schools have opened, serving 2,000 more students. Five more will come online next year. 2,300 more kids this year are attending magnet schools of excellence. 6,000 more kids are getting a full day of pre-K kindergarten. And this year, at my subtle urging, 13 Chicago public schools are offering a full school day. An additional 36 charter schools serving 17,000 students citywide will join them and transition to a full day of school. We've begun the largest turnaround of our neighborhood schools. Next year, 10 schools will be staffed with all new principals, all new teachers, all graduates of the AUSL program, which is a proven record of success in our schools. And nothing makes me prouder than this last fact. Beginning next year, every child in the Chicago Public School will get an additional 250 hours of instructional time in math, science, reading, geography, and history, equal to the kids around the world. Yeah. 
Every one of our children in Chicago, 55 more hours of math, 55 more hours of reading, 55 more hours of writing than they had the year before. That's doubling down on Chicago's children, and they deserve an equal education. But longer hours, a full day of school, and a full scale of school year doesn't do it all. Because you cannot do it unless you invest in the three things that matter year in and year out to everybody in this room, because that's how we got here. A principal that's willing to be accountable, a teacher that's motivated to teach, and a parent that is fully engaged. You put those three things together, and I'll give you a kid that's ready to go to school and ready to learn and who will be a success in life. It's what has got us all in this room here to join, as John Canning noted, the 1%. And the kids of the city of Chicago deserve no less. They're our kids. They're our future. This is our city. When it comes to modernizing our public education system and our community colleges, I will not take no for an answer. Any business that stands pat while the world changes is a business that's doomed to failure. Our city has no more important business than the education of its children. Change is always difficult. The status quo is always more comfortable. And I want to tell you, in seven months on this job, I learned that people hate the status quo and they're not too excited about change either. <laughs> Got them right where I want them. But when the status quo is failing, change is inevitable. We can resolve to help shape the future or allow ourselves to be shaped by it. And the people in this room are leaders, not followers. I'm not just talking about the members of the Economic Club. I'm talking about the young people who have joined us tonight. This is the future of Chicago. For the kids in this room and the students who aren't here but throughout the city of Chicago, we must resolve to do everything we can to make sure they are successful. I firmly believe we can other, overcome any obstacle if we're willing to confront our challenges with vision and with determination. That's why I ran for the job of mayor. In the past months, we have started the fight for change, and with your help, we will continue it. We can ensure that the future of our city and every student will be unlimited. We can be sure that our children and grandchildren can be as proud to call Chicago home as we are today. I want to thank you, God bless you, wish you a happy and a healthy new year, and God bless the children of Chicago. Just I that's, to, that's, yeah. mine. that's mine. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a natural talent now. Ron, that was, that was spectacular. Thank you. And I think your plan is designed to make the 1% 2 or 3%. You know, it's lonely at 1%. <laughs> and if you're successful, it'll go up to 5%. So that's great. Uh, I, can I, can't, I think, John, let's be honest, I think the 1% are trying to figure out how I got there. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we, we love you, we love okay. you being aboard. Okay. Um, the, I convened the nothing, nothing has ever spoken more from the heart from John than that. Uh, I, I convened the Republicans for Rom to, uh, yeah. to draw up some questions. You know, there's quite a few of them, so okay. we got a lot of questions. So let me, sticking on the education theme, in your inaugural address in May, you put special emphasis on the tragic gun deaths of, you, of children. How does the full school day interface with yours and Superintendent McCarthy's efforts to keep our uh, keep our streets safe and, and our children safe? Well, uh, first of all, a couple things. One, I did the full school day not for safety, although there's an additional benefit there. I did it because we had the shortest school day and the shortest school year. Nobody here got out of school at 2, at two o'clock or 2.15 unless you were ditching. <laughs> Nobody. And our kids are out at 2 o'clock or 2.15. 
We got there at 3.30 and then we figured out our after school activity and everything else. Our kids deserve a full day and a full year, as many as the hours I just talked about. That's number one. Number two, about three quarters, two thirds of all juvenile crime and victims of crime by juveniles occur between the hours of three and six. Why? Mom, mom and dad or grandma are out working. Kids are out of school. A full day complemented by a comprehensive after school program keeps our kids learning. Now you can put them in an adult supervised activity, doing athletics, academics, or arts. Whatever they self image and self awareness needs. Whatever it is. But a full day at school with adults committed, ready to learn, plus after school, and we're going to have a very, very rich school, a city. Thanks. Chicago will host the uh, NATO and G8 summits uh, this May, and Chicago will be the only city to have hosted both summits since London in the 1970s. What is your administration doing to prepare for such a major event, and how will those preparations affect Chicago's economy? Well, first of all, thank you. I think this is a unique opportunity for the city. It's a, an event in which literally close to three to 4,000 reporters worldwide will become the city of Chicago almost equal like the Olympics. Second, we'll have 45 world leaders, finance ministers, defense ministers, foreign ministers. London has, as you noted, hadn't had it since 1977. It's a type of world class, world class attention that a city that's with an international economic footprint and an economic model based on international uh, sales and marketing would crave for. We're preparing for it the proper way and getting ourselves organized as you know, Lori Healy's here. We're working on that day in and day out, both people at the police department, OEMC, and all the other functions. But this is a unique opportunity, in the same way the Olympics were, for the city to present itself to the world. Every finance member of the G8 and the six attending nations will be here. Every member of the G8 heads of state, plus the six additional countries from emerging markets, will be here. Every member of NATO, 28, Heads of state, foreign ministers, defense ministers will be here. Every member of ISAF, not full members of NATO, but partnering countries, heads of state, defense ministers, foreign ministers will be here. It's a unique opportunity to tell the world what we all know and hold dear to ourselves, that this is a world-class city with world-class potential. You know, job creation is clearly a top pr priority of the administration. Can you give us more insights into, into, the, into your plan and, you know, how have you done it in a tough <laughs> I, economy? And I will, but if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Uh, <laughs> no, here's, here, here's the basic. It's what, I, it's what you said, John. We have great assets. First of all, our people. Everybody knows it. Midwest values, hard working, hard ethic. Hard working ethic. Hard work ethic. I get up at five, way past my bedtime. I'm, number two, we're centrally located. You get anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country, directly. We're the only airport in America that has, in North America that has both major carriers. We have intermodal traffic juggernaut. We have great research institutions, great universities. We lead, literally, in major fields. Healthcare, some of the leaders right here. Risk management with CME, SIBO. Business consulting, insurance. We are the leaders in this field. McKinsey study did a report for World Business Chicago. While we've lost a big amount of manufacturing jobs, we're actually holding our own in high-end manufacturing jobs. What are we doing for it? Which is one of the things I was trying to address today. So while we lead in these sectors, transportation, as I said, healthcare, et cetera, I want to wake. I cannot create jobs. Now, that used to be the history in the city of Chicago. Government created jobs. I don't. I create conditions so you can create jobs. That's the difference. I create conditions. Those conditions, strong and stable government. Good education system. Accentuate our strengths in both the private sector and public sector. We'll never replace our location, but we've got to invest in our airport. A lot of people like the fact 
they can get, their employees can get from home to work conveniently. So our mass transit system has to be developed and constantly modernized. I have to make sure a lot of companies, Greg from uh, uh, Walgreens, he decided to put his e-commerce in Chicago. Why? Let's be frank. It's easier to find the type of workers for that section in Chicago than it is where the headquarters is. We have certain strengths. We need to accentuate them so the companies see the depth and richness of the city of Chicago and move on that and then market it. And ultimately, I got to provide safe streets, strong schools, stable finances. You give that, people will see leadership because we're shaping our future and we're not scared of it. And if you shape your future, people will bet on leadership. You, you may have heard there was a recent high profile public trial that ended in a 14 year sentence. Uh, U.S. history and, for 200. And whether we, and whether, <laughs> And whether we like to talk about it or not, our recent experience with corruption in Chicago and Illinois affects the image of our city and the state. How do you plan to address this daunting issue? Well, John, you said some of it in the introduction. One of the first things I did, I wasn't in office uh, two hours. I signed six executive orders, all related to ethics and campaign finance reform. Second is I had the city council make changes. I mean, you think it's normal, but if you used to be uh, an alderman, we were found corrupt, sent to serve time, you could still work on the city council when you got out of jail. That's over. Now I just impaneled the leaders in the state, all on ethics, gave them 120 days to come back with a series of reforms. It is a never-ending process. But here's something you've had now in the first six months. Somebody's a lobbyist, who they pay, who pays them, who their clients are, who they lobby, who they contribute, all online, easy to use. Number two, you used to work in my administration, you cannot lobby for two years when you leave. The revolving door is shut. I want what motivates you to be public service, not your Rolodex development. Three, I'm serious about that. I think it's a high honor to be in public service. And I want people to exude that I hire to exude that. They will, may never join the 1% after that, but that's it. <laughs> now the third is, but also, we've got a group and I want people, because look, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a progressive vision. And to have that, you have to have people have trust, have an affirmative view of government. And we're at a low end. One of the things is we violated it, both on the ethical side and how we do things. And part of what the ethics is, A, that's, I think, how you should conduct yourself. Back in 2005, Senator Obama and Congressman Emanuel introduced the ethics reform that passed in 2007. So I have a long history on this. I think it's about building trust confidence again that public service is one of the highest callings you can do in your life. So if, if we should get gambling, how, how do you ensure the integrity of gambling? Uh, well, first of all, you have a strong board and you have great board oversight. And that's number one. Number two, other cities are doing it and there's oversight and expansion are not inconsistent. They go together and people will only do that if they have trust in what you're doing. So you mentioned we have some great assets in Chicago. You know, during the current budget uh, constraints, how do you plan Chicago to keep Chicago a, a vibrant and growing city uh, and, the, and the physical planning of the city? For instance, um, what can we do to increase our lakefront and riverway as a recreational uh, attraction? Okay. First of all, I want you to know uh, Lawrence Massal is here. The city budget for the city of Chicago's corporate account, the one I just passed, park district, city colleges, Chicago public school system, all four received positive ratings by Lawrence Massal. And that's giving people confidence that we're headed, now we have hard work, but we're headed in the right direction. We got this thing turned in the right place. That's a long time since all four of them have been praised for what we're doing about putting our fiscal house in order and not being scared to make changes. That's no different than what President Preckwinkle is doing at the county right now. Being willing to shape the future, not be scared by it. Number two, you will see, look, when I got to Congress, I introduced the first time this whole concept of Lake Michigan Compact, or the Great Lakes Compact. What energy was for the last 30 years, water will be for the next 30 years. That is the most important commodity right out that window right out that door. Most important commodity. 
And we got to start investing in it, which is why I helped President Obama create $492 million in the Great Lakes Compact. I've also announced for our rivers that they will become the next recreational frontier. And we're putting four boathouses for kayaking, canoeing, sculling, and picnicking all along the river. Because when we were growing up, and still today, the river is for moving industrial cargo and raw sewage. It is an incredible asset. We have seven more miles of riverfront than we do lakefront. And it's what we all do now is just drive over it. Value along water is 10% higher than any other property, just by being next to water because of the beauty. If we invest in our river, our backyard can be as promising for us as our front yard, which is what the lake is. Great. TIF can be a, a powerful way to revitalize neighborhoods, but we also know that it can be controversial. How do you view <laughs> TIF? Uh, did you know you knew that? No, I can't. Yeah, it yeah, comes okay, with okay. the job. I, I did, that was not a scoop? Uh, uh, no. Okay. How, how do you view TIF assistance, and what do you think is the proper, its proper role should be and shouldn't be in Chicago's economic development? Look, for too long, I mean, I don't know, I assume everybody knows TIFs or tax increment financing. For too long, in my view, TIFs were seen as our only economic tool. I mean, part of what I'm discussing tonight is our workforce. Pat Wirtz said to me at ADM, she's looking for welders. 44 bucks an hour, guys, plus health care and, and pensions. That's also true for Caterpillar, looking for welders. With 10% unemployment, people are looking for people paying 44 bucks an hour and can't find them. Our workforce is our great economic tool. Our airport is our great economic tool. Our public transportation system is our great economic tool. The people in this room who are leaders in industry is our great economic tool. Northwestern, University of Chicago, DePaul, hopefully our community colleges, is our great economic tool. We have many economic tools. TIF is one tool in a very complicated, complex, and rich toolbox. I've used it once to help Sara Lee come home to its rightful place, Chicago. But I want to say this. GE has 1,100 employees in the city of Chicago. The first week I was mayor, they announced they're going to expand it to another 1,000, doubling the size. There was no TIF. United was looking at Chicago and other cities for its operations center, 1,300 employees. They picked Chicago for all the assets I was talking about. Not because I was sitting there with TIF, which is a legitimate thing. You have to reform it. You have to use it strategically. But if all you do is think TIF is the only tool you have, you're, you're putting everything else on the sideline, and you're not playing your best cards first. You know, um, one of the early impressive things you focused on were the food deserts on the, on, the, on the south side and west side. Is there a strategy to encourage small business development in Chicago neighborhoods, or are we you know, trending towards uh, supporting the mini versions of the big box retailers. You know, I did a, uh, well, first of all, let me say something uh, about the food desert. You know, where I live, Amy and I, we have four or five grocery stores within a mile. Trust me, I'm sent to them usually at about 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> but no, it's, it's serious. And I meet people they have to go four or five miles to find a grocery store for fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, I want to single out Greg Wasson from Walgreens. They're opening 15 stores throughout the city of Chicago that aren't the Walgreens we know. They have five aisles with all fresh fruits and vegetables, employ 50 people. They are not just fresh fruits and vegetables for the right reason. They're an economic engine in those neighborhoods. They go up. There's construction jobs. They employ a pharmacy. They've moved the pharmacy up front so people can get their health care, the right type of food. Now, as I said, I merely provide opportunity. Parents have to take responsibility, walk in there and do the right thing by their kids. Can't demand it. But I want you to know this. Now, Greg's going to align his economic interests because that's job opportunity economic growth. Our job was to make sure that the regulatory process was smooth, fast, so they can move those stores. We had a conference here. First Lady Michelle Obama came to the second one. Walgreens, Walmart, 
Aldi save a lot. We're going to reduce the 400,000 people that are affected by half. Give them economic opportunity, job growth, and a chance to have their kids walk by and have a normal neighborhood where they can go in and see fresh fruits and vegetables. Last week we announced $1 million in microlending for 250 small businesses to get the type of microlending we did at a place called, a restaurant called Mr. Taco. Guy put together $135,000 of family money, couldn't get started, a bank wouldn't see him normally, no credit rating. Microlending facility from Axion, he's now expanding, he's now looking at a second business. The banks are now looking at him because he has a credit rating. And so we're going to create 250 new small businesses through this microlending that was first developed by the United States through the UN in third world countries and the greatest markets are right here in this country. The city. The city is currently deploying a managed competition model in the city's recycling program, allowing for private companies and the public sector to bid on providing recycling services. Do you plan to replicate this model in other areas of city services? Yeah, first of all, yes, in eight different sectors, uh, tree trimming, booting, et cetera, we're doing it. Now, one of the great things, besides getting the taxpayers the best price and the best service, I've met with the workers of streets and sanitation. They are actually going to this process excited. They tell you they're going to win. Now, when was the last time you saw a public employee say, hey, I want to win this? No, the competition, I, to, win, to do what I need to do as mayor for all of you, the taxpayers, I got to bring back a sense of competition, a sense of cultural change inside public service. The fact that people doing recycling think they're gonna, they're, they are out there trying to win a contract has already changed the way they're delivering service. And I get every week the reports on how waste management is doing against streets and sanitation. Both are going to be, you know, represented by unions. They're both Teamsters and Labor's union. It's not private sector non-union versus public sector union. But the competition has set up a process where they're doing better and faster and quicker and getting a whole different mindset that you find normal in the private sector is like revolutionary in the public sector. But, that, but here's the credit. Chicago Federation of Labor has agreed to be a partner in that, meaning now I'm not debating, not having a fight over it. Eight sectors, mano a mano, public sector versus private sector, best service, best price, most reliable service delivery, you win. Whoever wins, taxpayers win in the end. You know, uh, the, the full school day, uh, day was positively received by everyone but I, I wouldn't go by everyone but I, I think I had it was very a, I positive had a, I, had, I, had, I was not done <laughs> uh, are there other reforms we haven't heard about yet that are in this in CPS that that are doable in the context of uh, your union contracts and well first of all we just are embarking now on the largest uh, both what I would call the turnover of schools to schools of excellence from AUSL now let me say something about the AUSL model. I went to my old Wright Community College in my congressional district, was a K through, uh, was a uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. Helped create the high school there. They trained teachers to get in with the master's of education one year in the classroom, and then the graduates go to another school that becomes a neighborhood turn, uh, turnaround. Now, every one of these schools, Zipporah Hightower, who's a principal at Bethune, scores are up. On average, double what is the rest of CPS, because it's not one teacher, one principal. The entire teacher core, principal, everybody removed. New principal, new teachers, the whole system. The results are not once, twice. They run 17 schools. We're now doing 10 of them in that model. And what is most impressive to me, at each of these schools, parent participation in the parent-teacher conferences is at 75%. Because if you do a good school with good teachers, parents will respond. That's the recipe to success. We're also doing an expansion of charters. For the first time now, Gates is funding the Charter Compact. They'll be under the oversight of CPS. They don't lose their independence, but they'll be accountable for results, which has not happened before. 
We're also expanding our, as I said, we're doubling the size, 50% increase of our pre-K all day school. Because you can't make it up if you lose it in the years one through five. 14 schools have got the state of the art security cameras that we put at Fenger. My whole idea is to invest in the classroom and take it out of the bureaucracy. So there's more changes to come. We can't afford to keep on the status quo. And the good news is the kids uh, are showing, I think, the type of promise given their attendance and what's going on. Now, let me also say, John, principals for years were getting report cards out of their schools. We're making that all available now to parents. I can't ask parents to be involved if I pull back information. Every school will have a four-year performance contract. We can rate the performance of the principal. We're the first school system in the country to give principals performance pay. You improve your scores for your kids, teacher quality, you're going to get a bonus. It's the first school system, the CEO of the school system, performance pay. Principals, performance pay. Teachers, performance pay. It's the school, first school system from the classroom to the corporate suite, inside CPS, everybody's on performance pay. Diversity is a goal we all struggle with attaining in our businesses and our organizations. How do you approach diversity in Chicago government and in your capacity as a leader of the city? Well, first of all, I want the diversity of experience and I want the diversity of opinions. I want to make sure, and I've seen it, and one of the things I'm most impressed having worked with both President Obama and President Clinton is they weren't scared to have people give a divergent of views. And you can only get the divergent of views if you have divergent experiences that are brought to bear. And I, you have to work on it all the time. A lot of us work at it. You can't kind of check the box. You got to make sure you're always ex making yourself accessible to a lot of views, a lot of experiences, and your appointments reflect that top to bottom. But I'll also say one of the other things. I mean, I take the L about once or twice to work. I also try to get around. Today I was in North Lawndale doing a community tour. Very impressive what they got there. The worst thing to do, I think, in public service is to be isolated upstairs away from actual experiences. The thing I have to do is remember the voices, the experiences, and the stories of the people you meet so you can carry it up to your desk. Like the young man I said tonight, who was on 35th and Dan Ryan, he's going to Harold Washington. He's working. He has a basic agreement. He's showing all the things you want somebody to do. And if I didn't hear that, and we are joking tonight about 1%, but in all seriousness, we have to, in my position, and I think also in yours, you got to be able to hear the voices and the stress in people's lives. There's a lot of pressure on middle class families trying to just hold on, provide for their families, provide them a good living, make sure their kids have a shot at a future. And the most important thing I can do is not only have the diversity racially, sexually, ethnically, is to make sure I have the diversity of opinions that are coming to me so you don't get isolated in these jobs. Okay. <clears throat> I have to be honest, my nomination was conditioned by Andy McKenna on finishing by 9 o'clock, and he okay. said he would reconvene Where are we? the former chairs. Five so, up? I'll be quick. Ups. No, no, no. Yeah, I've I'll got, be quick. Uh, but I've got, I've got a, a, a final round of questions. We call I got a final round of answers. <laughs> I, I had no doubt. Yeah. So this is, the way this works is I ask you a question. You've got to give me the first thing that comes into your mind. Right. Isn't it, don't, don't I really need Blue Cross and Blue Shield for this, so here, for my mental health? Most fun day since taking office. Most fun day since taking office? I would say uh, when we passed the, uh, although I wasn't in office, when we passed the uh, legislation in Springfield for the full day and full year. Oh, let me say no. I'll give you another one. That, that wasn't the rule. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to give you uh, three quick examples. Jeez. Okay, yeah. No, you'll hear. I have, I have too many fun days, obviously. 
We have ESPN rated Simeon the best high school basketball team in the country. <laughs> Mather High School just won for the first time in the state of Illinois in 30 years, the soccer championship. They have five continents on that team. I called a young man, 10th grader, Whitney Young, national champion, chess, ch chess champion. Our kids are great kids. Go. Okay. Uh, the, the Farmer's Almanac predicts uh, the winner of 2012 will be, will be one of the worst ever. What do you think? <laughs> let, let, nothing will measure against the blizzard last year. That was a 100 a year, and don't quote me on it this winter. In, uh, if Chicago of the 1800s was the city of big shoulders, what body part represents Chicago? <laughs> I think after today? night, big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the truth is, no, the truth is I've seen it every day. We have a big heart. We're known for big shoulders. There is, look at this. You guys love your city. No other city can do what we do. No other city has this. We have the greatest reserve of love and affection for our city. Affection. Favorite two restaurants in Chicago, one north, one south. <laughs> you got to be kidding. No. Nope. I'm not making you go west. Okay. On the north side, it's not, it is favorite in the sense that it's, uh, when I was a congressman, Amy and I used to go there for date night. It's called uh, Glenn's. It's a fish restaurant on Montrose. And then Nightwood down in Pilsen. All right. Fred Bussey, a Republican, was mayor of Chicago 104 years ago when the Cubs won the World Series <laughs> during his first. Will the Cubs finally repeat during your administration? Well, given that you got your first Jewish mayor, it's a safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> that I will say that, this. That right. tells me you're gonna you're gonna run several more uh, re-election you know, campaigns. I, I will say I said this to my office but then they, when the Cubs picked Theo Epstein, the Bears got Gabe. I said, you know, are people losing their minds? Nobody would ever have a Jew in sports. What the hell's going on around here? <laughs> who, who will win the Republican nomination for president? People usually pay a lot of money for that advice, John. Republicans for a Yeah. You know, I'm actually beginning to see, feel sorry for Republican primary voters. Uh, look. Uh, I withdraw the question. Yeah, I don't. The, you know what? It's, it is. Here, look. Can we shut those cameras off? I withdrew the question. Uh, uh, okay. Here's, here's, here's how you look at it. Our party always goes for the outsider. George McGovern. People forget this. Bill Clinton was the outsider. That is the history of our party. We go out. Republicans go corporate ladder. CFO, CEO, CEO, CEO. So you would normally, which is how John McCain got it, Bob Dole, just look at the history of it. Now, normally, you would go Mitt Romney. But in a year like this, I wouldn't go with normal. Newt's showing uh, a, a stamina that uh, is a challenge. Mitt Romney is also showing, in my view, uh, obviously, the Republican primary voters are having challenge, you know, warming to him. That said, having watched Newt for years, I'd be interested what happens by Wednesday with him. So I don't know. Final question. Favorite four-letter word? Love. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. Can, uh, can anybody believe this is only seven months? So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.